Welcome to the School of Athens. I'm your host, Avik Wadifer, along with my co-hosts, Charlie Scales and Carter Otis. All right. Now, Carter, where did we leave off last week? Let's see. Last week, if I remember correctly, we were talking about existentialism. A lot of the great existentialists. We talked about uh, nihilism, and the idea that life has no inherent meaning. We talked a little bit briefly about the meaning of life, uh, things like that, as far as I remember. Now, that idea of nihilism, that like life has no meaning, I don't know, that, that seems a little depressing. It does seem a little depressing, right? I mean, I think we kind of hope that there's there's meaning or like there's there's purpose behind stuff. Otherwise, you know, why do we do it? I mean, there's this there's this problem almost. Um, and Charlie, I don't know if you had anything to say about this kind of mental health crisis that's been going on in this Western world of ours. But, you know, existentialism exists uh, and it's been making a comeback in our modern society for a reason Mm -hmm. yeah i think a lot of it is um people are really starting to realize when they have all these like you know these accommodations like the standard of living is higher than it's ever been in the history of the world yet we have rising suicide rates and what what this seems like is like it's a inverse relationship you know when we get when we get healthier when we get happier we get more depressed right but i think it's actually representative of something deeper within human psychology is that we are suddenly in this world where we can get anything we want at the tip of our fingers or the push of a button but it still isn't making us happy and i think a lot of that is that we have misunderstood um misunderstood what really happiness and success is for so long that we are starting to feel the repercussions. Oh, and just a brief aside for all of our listeners, um, we will be touching upon some subjects such as depression and suicide. And while we aren't exactly going to particularly graphic detail, we still feel that it's worth mentioning that, you know, if you feel uncomfortable, feel free to, well, turn to another station, unfortunately. <laughs> I guess, uh, Charlie, I'd respond to your point by saying, I don't know, is is the standard of living, you know, that much that much higher than it always has been? I mean, I understand, right? We have wonderful things like like Amazon and the internet, right? They can they can bring us stuff, but you know, there are also things that are a lot higher, like uh, like uh, like student loan debt, for example, is also higher than it's been before. And I mean, financial status is something that causes a lot of stress and depression for a lot of people, right? So, I mean, I don't know. I think, like, from a materialist standpoint, yeah, maybe you could say, like, you know, we have the best technology that's ever existed. But I don't know if, you know, we're living in, like, a, an emotional renaissance, I guess. Well, is it about an emotional renaissance or is it about a, well, I guess, like you said, material renaissance? I mean, I think part of the point that Charlie was making is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, the, this, the progress of the Western world seems inextricably tied to the progress of our material, to the progress of our wealth, to the progress of our technology. And we've achieved all of that things, and yet there's no emotional progress. Right. We're still the same ape on the plane, right? We still need those actionable, you know, fight or flight responses, but we don't have any of those. All of our problems now are, ta- are intangible, like unemployment, like, you know, these, these, you know, social problems that exist entirely on a realm of, on a digital realm. Right, and we can't do anything about them. We can't fight, flight, or flee. I um, heard this interesting. Well, I guess I guess I'd quote him uh, by Rodrigo, a, a fellow student, where um, around around campus he mentioned that the human mind was simply not meant to. And this was in a different context. It was this was in the context of astronomy? But he made a point where the human mind, Charlie, like you're saying, is simply not meant to deal with the pressures and the knowledge that we have today we were meant to calculate at most the trajectory of a thrown rock uh we were not meant to really understand the universe and probe its inner limits in the sense that you know that's not what we evolved to do we evolved to fight flee or freeze um and charlie like you mentioned a lot of our problems not only are they self-inflicted um but they simply aren't solvable by the tools that we're given by nature I feel like I disagree with that, though. To say, like, we're not meant to do these complex things implies that we're meant to do something, right? That implies that there is, like, there is a creator who made people for a purpose. I think if you believe in evolution, then you can't say that 
you know, things aren't meant to do something because that's what they've always done, right? Fish weren't meant to walk on land and then they started doing it and then it became okay. Wow. Like that, that's how evolution works is you, you do something that you're not meant to do until you become good at it. So that, you know, yeah, maybe it's not, maybe it's not pretty now. Maybe our, our brains aren't especially built for you know, doing complex things or, you know, more complex than I guess, you know, have done in the past. But I, I don't think you can say that we're not meant to do it. I would think about it this way that, when you see a bear in the wild, what do you do? You either fight or you, or you run away, right? Yeah. And so when you, when you get an unemployment check, what do you do? You cry. <laughs> you get in your own head. You, you start thinking, or you know, not, not a check, like a you know, notice of right. your, your job has been taken away. You have to t- go home and tell your family, right? You can't, you can't just run away from that. You can't just fight it. It's this deep-seated problem that stirs in your mind. That you can't do anything action about, actionable about, right? And so that, that I think what that does is that it, it really just it gets to this part of the human psyche that just doesn't know how to cope with those things. And these problems of existential dread. Like, oh God, we now know that at any moment an asteroid could slam into our planet killing all of us. What do you do with that, right? Just because we know that, what does that do, right? Can't do anything about it. So I think it's just, and not only is this knowledge, it's also this, the the actual, you know, environment we put ourselves in, which is one of progress, is one of, is one of, is one of work and, and, um, and labor and, you know, conformity and service, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, don't know, I, I I hate to say that, like, it's a capitalism thing, but I think it might be a capitalism thing. <laughs> I think, I, think I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't, I think it would be I would, way I more... Would, I would say that, okay. I mean, the whole idea of Here capitalism, right, is to put value arbitrarily in a thing, like a currency, and say that, like, you know, this, this getting this is good, not having it is bad. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of this comes, like, like unemployment, for example, right? People you know, put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy into a thing to get this currency. And then, you know, either when they lose that currency, like I mentioned, like with financial stress before, you know, they lose the ability to get the currency, then it, then it becomes bad you know, and because people stop and they wonder, like, why have I been doing this? Why, why have I been trying to get money? Like, you know, they realize that, you know, money is just like a made up value, right? Like that's, that's, the, whole, that's the whole capitalism thing. Well, I mean, Carter, to your point about capitalism being about arbitrary values and everything, I think it's important, there's an important distinction to be made that every economic and political system is about assigning arbitrary values. Every system of thinking is about assigning arbitrary values. That's true. And I I just think it's capitalism more to an extent, right? Because, like, you know, you're, you're specifically making like you're printing money to like, and you're saying this has value because I say it has value. Which I think is is different than you know other systems. You know maybe that that value like work for example that would say like you know this is value because it does this. I mean I I get that yes they're mm-hmm. all a, they're all meaningless because everything is meaningless which we'll probably get to in a second. But um, I, I I feel like I don't know I would say that capitalism you know is is more arbitrary in saying that, you know, this this is meaningless but we're gonna pretend it has meaning for a second. What I was going to say, though, is that I think it's more of like a progress thing where if we look around it and, yeah, the, the capitalist system has, you know, it's, its flaws, right? And so does every other economic system with 7 billion people on the planet because we can't feel like we belong anymore, right? Because there's too many people. We can't go and start a commune because there's like laws against it now, you know what I'm saying? And we can't, we can't just feel like we belong in a, crowd, a sea of humans because that's not how our brains work. And when we start working, we we can't can't find pleasure in that because it's menial. It it it's someone extracting our hard labor. Even if it was even if it was a syndicalist society, we have all these accoutrements that come with that, and 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 these are actively reducing our mental health, like like the phone, for example. I mean, I mean not not even the phone, like. Like agriculture, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Like I, I don't know how far back we have to go to say, okay, here's when humanity start stopped being 
you know, happy, right? When we started being sedentary, maybe. When we started being industrial, maybe. When we started being digital, that's another point you could draw. But it seems like with the rising depressing rate, depression rates, suicide rates that come out every year, that all these things that we're striving for, who are they actually serving, right? Who are they actually benefiting if we're not dealing with our emotional health first? So then, I mean, existentialism is more of you know what we went over last week. Um, as a, it's more a system of, or sorry, uh, not even system of thought. It's more just a intellectual movement. But specifically, we talked about nihilism and absurdism, and nihilism as this idea of the 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 destruction of value and the actual devaluation of everything that we have, which includes money, which also includes religion, which also includes like morals, which also includes like ethical systems, which also includes justice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and almost every single, like a lot of, quite a few philosophers, including the most famous one for, for talking about nihilism, my man, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, um, all of, most of them kind of fought against nihilism. They wanted to, they wanted to get rid of it. And so we talked a little about Camus, if y'all remember, right, in that making your own kind of meaning. I mean, what does that mean in today's society, in, you know, the the modern human condition, if you will? Like, how can you construct your own meaning while also being situated within society, within living with other people? Can you? Or is it just something simply unassailable, or, or sorry, unattainable, to be able to construct a satisfactory meaning while also participating in such a society that assigns arbit such arbitrary value to such arbitrary things. Yeah, I mean, I don't I guess I would say in in today's world that looks like, I don't know, do doing things that make you happy. I mean, I think I think that's what it's always been about, right? This is doing things that make you happy, but I mean, I don't know, that, that also I guess means like, you know, picking a career that makes you happy or or doing work that makes you happy. I don't know. I mean, for for us students, it's almost college looking at time, and so it's it's, you know, part of that is thinking like, you know, what, what do I want to do that's, you know, that's going to make me happy or that's going to make me fulfilled, at least for me, for some people, it's what, what's going to make me money. But I mean, I think, yeah, for, for some people that, that looks like, um, you know, that looks like getting a job for other people that's, you know, hobbies or family. I think, you know, it's, it's hard to, to necessarily have it perfect, but I think that's, you know, they, that's part of the idea of society, right? Is, is you, you give up a little bit of freedom to have you know, security. And maybe that little bit of freedom you give up is actually what we really need <laughs> in order to be happy, right? And that safety, I mean, it's, it's nice. I, and if, if you can't tell, I talk about this a lot, but um, that a lot of people, when I tell them my plans of, you know, running off into the woods and everything and, you know, going back to nature, um, the first concern is safety. The first concern is, oh, aren't you going to die young? And I'm, and to me, that's a non-issue, right? That's a non issue Like, why would you care if you die young if everybody else is living their entire lives without knowing our full potential, without knowing how sound and secure we can feel in our own minds, as opposed to these, you know, cyclical, daily like existences we all lead, right? And that little bit of freedom, as Carter put it, the freedom to just move and and hunt and gather and 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 exist in that society that is not, you know, based around massive uh, progress and and mechanical. Uh, you know, where you become a cog in this machine, no matter what, if you're a part of a society, you're part of a, the machine that pushes society forward. And I guess it's about the type of machine you want to be a part of. If you want to be a part of the, you know, machine that drains you for your entire lifespan, then by all means, go ahead. Charlie, what a monologue. And we're back. This is School of Athens. My name is Avik Wadavkar. I'm Charlie Scales. And I'm Carter Otis. 
And now we just left off with Charlie's incredible speech. Um, <laughs> but about, I mean, Charlie, you mentioned, you know, moving out to the wilderness and kind of reuniting with that, with that uh, for, for lack of a better word, the feral life. Um, I don't know if you have a better word, maybe the natural life. Feral. Feral? That's it. All right. Well, the feral life, you heard it here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that is the, that is the way to be happy. Um, according but me. according to Charlie Scales. According to me and like the Hudson. And, try I don't know. I, I could, I could, I'll, I'll try and, I'll try and take an opposite stance to that one. I don't know. I, I find myself someone who enjoys society in right. general. Right. I mean, I, I like, you know, going to sleep and, and being reasonably sure I'll wake up the next day. Right. Or, or reasonably sure I'll be able to find food, even, even though it might cost me money. Right. And so I don't know. I think you're kind of saying that like living in society is is a total loss, right? You're saying that you know being in the society we live in is always going to be worse than living in the natural world. And I just don't know if that's true. And I don't either. I don't think that's true at all. I think that there are so many benefits. I mean, look at the library, right? You could not know what the Roman Empire was doing in the year 276 without a library. You could not know without all the history and all the societies we built i mean not the society the with all that we've documented over the years man and just diving into that is one of my greatest joys however while i acknowledge that there are some tremendous benefits for example medicine right that's pretty good um i would also say that the problems that we have and if you if you just ask yourself the question like why am i why do i have the desire to um learn right why do i have the desire to feel like i need to um go out and only get my food from a grocery store and that's because we've been raised in it already that's because we've already been you know conditioned to think this way you can't just take away someone's like entire you know livelihood and say now you'll be happy no they won't they don't know how to live they don't know how to do anything and and now i think the the difference is when i when you look at the hadza actually when you really look at them there are these tribe in Tanzania tested for the highest happiness, quote unquote, happiness levels in the world. They're just so communally focused and like they are abundantly healthy. They don't need medicine because they don't. And, and this, is a, this is a whole co- course I could speak upon basically. But <laughs> the fact that agriculture actually created the problems that we're now addressing with medicine or uh, with orthopedics, with um, uh, what's it called? Orthodontics, not orthopedics. What's well, it could be orthopedics. Orthopedics is shoe stuff. Shoe stuff. Yeah, that's that's another one. Because yeah, whatever. I'm not gonna get into it. But there's a lot of stuff that we're only just beginning to address with medicine that we've already we already had solved before we even started settling. But but also yeah, I do agree that you know some things are really nice like. Yeah, comfortable yeah, blankets and, and a home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I guess, Charlie, I'd ask you, you know, in your in your trip off to the wilderness, is there anything you'd take with you, or you you just no. kind of go for it? Stone Age, really? So so why no comfy blankets or no Bluetooth headphones? You know, why why like you know nothing? Why? Because comfort is the antithesis of of real comfort, which is the which is the the fortitude of the mind. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever backpacked? Have you ever camped? Yeah. Have you ever slept on the ground? Yeah. Did you ever notice that when you were on the ground, you didn't notice all those little jaggy bits and you didn't notice how your spine was just like slightly to the side because there was other things more pressing, like how cold you were, for example, or yeah. a large rock in your side. Sure, sure. You didn't notice every little detail. It's the whole princess and the pea thing where the princess has been raised her whole life in perfect comfort. And so she notices the littlest, littlest pea. Under 30 match, I don't know how many it mm-hmm. was in the story, but that's my, that's my whole thing. When I, when I sleep in a bed and I, you know, I try to keep it simple, but when I sleep in a bed, every little twitch and turn, I'm like, oh, I'm not comfortable anymore. I need to reorient myself. And then it becomes a whole other thing, right? Because it's all about relativity and <laughs> general, rel- no, <laughs> If you if you think relatively, oh yeah, clearly I'm. It's not going to be that big a deal if I you know go hungry today because I have food tomorrow, right? Or like because I'm a little cold now, but it's better than you know actively being eaten by a lion. 
I don't know. It's like, it's it, it's about picking your poison, I guess. I I I don't I just still don't know if it is though. I I mean I I hear what you're saying, but I still think I mean I feel like there are a lot of people in modern society that are, are happy. Definitely, I feel like like I, I definitely agree that there's you know there's, there's been a rise in suicide or a rise in depression globally, but I you know, I don't think that that's necessarily like you know, a, something that has to exist in society. I think that maybe it does based on you know the way that you know we have treated mental health in the past. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, continue to treat it today, I guess. But um, I, I don't think that that's necessarily a, you know, a societal issue. You know, societies will always be like this. Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I'm just an idealist, but that's just me. Right. So then, I mean, we've identified a lot of problems and we've identified, uh, well, Charlie's identified his solutions, which is just leave society. Mm, quit. Uh-huh. I mean, within this, within this dissatisfaction that people feel, um, you know, yes, yes, it's true that if you look at global suicide trends, for instance, um, well, the highest is Russia, um, but then after, and then I believe it is South Africa, then the U.S., then South Korea, and then Japan, or my, it's. Yeah, South Korea and then Japan. And so there are a lot of first world countries that are particularly high. If you look at, you know, maps um, where suicide rates are reported, a lot of first world countries are affected. And in the US, suicide is an epidemic. And people talk about it, yes. But at the same time, I don't know if there's anything, um, I guess, in terms of the mindset that we're, you know, first of all, in terms of the mindset for this meaningless, for fighting this meaningless, I mean, Charlie, you're finding meaning in surviving, but be, but you have to limit yourself, right? You're not, you're living well within, or well, not, you're, you're not living within your means. You're limiting your own means um, to live and fight and have to, you know, survive another day. And so, Charlie, you're limiting yourself in order to feel happy. Uh, but for one, is that the goal? Um, and Happiness? Is ha- well happiness or satisfaction? I think yeah. Like, isn't the whole point of life? Like, <laughs> well, I mean, okay. Look, there. If you ask anybody here, for example, at Exeter, hey, why do you want to go into the profession you want to go into? Or say that it's like a say it's a guy who really loves business or really is involved in a lot of business oriented things. You ask him, hey, why do you want to do business? He says, so I can get a business job. He says. Well, why business? And he says, well, it makes a lot of money. I mean, if you, you could press him a lot, but it'll, eventually, eventually you can agree that he will say, because it makes money. And you say, why do you want to make money? Well, so I can support my family. Why do you want to have a family that you can support? And no matter where that conversation goes, it's always going to come down to, because I want to be happy. When I'm retired and I, when, I, when I'm in my golden years, I want to look back and say, oh yeah, I did what I, you know, needed to to be happy in this time right so i made it you know i'm retired i i did it i did it right so the entire point of their existence is to be happy yet they aren't (laughs) if you ask anyone you know you look at the actual people that are doing finance they are the most sad individuals you ever seen in your life they're wasting their lives away you know what I'm saying? And I, that to me is the biggest thing that, that stands out. It's that we strive for happiness, but when it's right in front of us, we don't want it because it's, it's, a, it's, it's separate from what we perceive as, like the, the modern happiness is so far removed from what we would say like is actual fulfillment. I think I don't know. <laughs> so I mean, you guys have you guys have raised some great points, but upon fact checking, um, the the ten uh, countries in the world with the highest suicide rates are as follows: uh, Lesotho, Guyana, Eswatini, Kiribati, Micronesia, Suriname, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Mozambique, Central African Republic, uh, and uh, none of those 
would be considered developed countries. Maybe South Africa, actually. Um, you know, Russia is 11th, South Korea is 12th. But I was my argument. <laughs> it was my argument. Yeah, I was. I was gonna say. I mean, I, some some great points. But I think uh, upon fact checking, I don't know if this whole like you know we we have more but we're less happy narrative is is necessarily true. I mean, I, I think just looking at the numbers, it's it's hard to say that there's a trend between them. That's crazy because I'm looking at some numbers right here, uh, and they do oh in fact God. say Russia, South Africa, <laughs> South Korea, Wait, US, your... and Japan. I so. I don't. Okay. Anyways, I don't want this to be become a battle of mm. oh, which source is better. I will battle you over which source is better. That is not what School of Athens is. Actually, you know that's what School of Athens could be meant for. Um, Bro was looking at the opposite scale. He was looking at the. Least, I was not. I was high. not. Look at this. See, look at that. That is we the largest. The, that is the largest number of pre- hundred thousand oh, people. It actually is. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is this is also the largest number of a hundred thousand, and it says Russia okay. in selected countries for twenty nineteen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Whatever. Um. <laughs> Uh, like this is as published by the World Health Organization. This is also published by the World <laughs> Health Organization. Okay. In what year? Uh, 2019. <laughs> I think this. <laughs> wait, what? This is also 2019. Are you? Are wait? Are you looking at like that? Is that is crazy? Okay. Um. Well, I'm. I'm. I'm gonna. Okay. Philosophy. I'll find. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, back to philosophy. You know, the the debate may still be out. I guess we can we can talk theoretically though. Like, you know, does does having more make you less happy? Because I I feel like as as far as you know the word world population average goes, I have like a fair amount of stuff, um, and I think I'm pretty happy as a person. I think I might be less happy if I had less stuff. Um. I don't know. I feel like that's, a, that's like the very cliche, you know, like money doesn't buy happiness, but like definitely does I feel a like lot. <laughs> definitely does though. Like yeah. like money maybe Dude. you can't directly buy it, but like you can you can buy a good amount of happiness. You yeah. ever heard the saying uh, you know, money can't buy happiness, but it's a lot more comfortable to cry on a Lamborghini than cry on a, your bicycle. Mm, yeah, yeah, I have heard that. Yeah, and I mean I don't know. Like I feel like if you ask someone who's like homeless, like, "Oh, you have you have nothing, so you should be really happy." Like, no. Like yeah, I mean, you you can't go to the store and be like, "I'd like one happiness, please." And they're like, oh, here you go. But the thing is, homeless people are they don't have any material in a society which values material, right? And right. so that's that's the tension there. Because if you were, um, you know, Charlie, like you mentioned, the, the the tribe you were talking about, they don't have as much material as we do, and they're presumably happier with their existence. They don't have like a concept of suicide, right? Right, and that that's what. There was an interview on Joe Rogan by a dude. Of course. Um, that he he visited them and they do open tours. Um, and he was telling them like he he was worked for a modeling agency at the time and he was like, Come back, you look great, you're so healthy. Let's let's you know, come to America and we'll take pictures of you. And the guy was like, Why would I ever want to go to America? Isn't that where they kill themselves? Isn't that where they jump off buildings? And they never heard of such a thing until people came over and said, "Oh yeah, my, you know, sister, you know, she, she took her own life." And 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 they were like, "What? Why would why would someone do that? You know, existence is beautiful." <laughs> and it, these are anecdotal evidence. These are anecdotal examples. But to me, that's the most glaring issue: is that we have a society that's built around around you know success, you know money progress, uh, possessions. But if you take that all away, you, you're, of course you're going to be happy. If you, take, if you take the things that society values away, you're going you're to be unhappy. But if you go to a different kind of thinking about things that doesn't value those, it actually values discomfort and it values struggle for gain. And that's why, you know, people that work out, right? People that work out are, Happy as heck. I mean, not not everyone, but like people that, you know, really give themselves to exercise, really give themselves, you know, like crew. I was the happiest I've ever been when I did crew because I was working for something. I, I had struggle. We're like a battery that, that, you know, if you leave it for a long time, it gets overflowed and it gets all dirty. If you start using it, we need that release. We need that struggle for for some sort of objective, I think. That should be though. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, this reminds me of the myth of Sisyphus that we talked about right, in the last yeah. episode. You know, the, they're mm. rolling the boulder up a hill and then it falls back down. And, you know, what's the purpose? But I don't know. I feel like there's there's definitely a balance in that struggle, right? Because if, if you go off into, in, into the wild, like, your life is now entirely struggle, right? Your, your every day, all, all of your actions are to prevent you from dying. Whereas, you know, I think in society, you know, maybe that's on the other end of the spectrum where you'd say, like, People don't necessarily have enough struggle, maybe, right. or, or certain certain people, I guess, don't have enough struggle that you know they they find themselves without purpose. But I think there's definitely a happy medium in between, which is I don't know why I'd say I'm definitely pro society, yeah. and that like I I think for me my happy medium is in society that I think it's still very possible to find you know defined purpose within society. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's what you know. People that, you know, do marathons, right? I mean, that's like the whole point, right? <laughs> You're working towards something and you and you eventually get to it. And you eventually can say, finally, I, I, I did what I'd set out to do. And that's beautiful. But, uh, you know. Charlie, is your, uh, is your boulder hitting two plates on back squat? What's your, what's your boulder? I don't really have one. My boulder is like right now, I'm just trying to get through life. <laughs> get, get, through, to, get, get through to, school. Yeah, get, get, to, <laughs> get to the summer. In the uh, summer. Speaking of which, uh, for all our viewers, um, two things. One, unfortunately, this will be our last show of the year. Of the year. Of the year. We'll be back. Uh, unfortunately will, for you listeners, we will be back. I know. We'll be taking up your airwaves from, uh, well, I, I don't think we'll be at the same time. Uh, but regardless, you'll hear from us. Um, but first of all, if you guys have any, uh, for all of our listeners out there, if you have any uh, comments, questions, concerns, things you'd like us to talk about, uh, feel free to reach out to one of us at uh, 361 254 4279 or just call up WPEA and uh, give our uh, give Exeter a shout out for the School of Athens. Tell us what a great job. Tell them what a great job we're doing. Uh, but, anyways, that's one thing. And the second thing is. And we're back. This is Exeter Jazz Lounge. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> this nice is, try, though. This is School of Athens. Um, I'm your host, Avik Wadifkar. I'm Charlie Scales. And I am Carter Otis. And uh, when we left off, Charlie, we left off with, um, well, we left off with happiness. Where did we leave off? I have no idea. Uh, mm, that's fair. We, uh, it was society. Uh... A, lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Um, but struggle okay. that's what it was Sisyphus oh struggle. right yes it's struggle. always Sisyphus, always comes back to Sisyphus yeah, yeah it always comes full always circle does. like a boulder rolling down a mountain oh my, oh my gosh it's like I, a cycle no no that's I don't that, um, that feels that feels forced here's <laughs> fine <laughs> here's a thought uh, maybe maybe you know living in a in a society you know like capitalism per se you know like the society most of western civilization uses isn't so good because instead of, you know, one big mountain, like Charlie said, like marathon runners, right? Their goal is to like finish a marathon. That's their mountain. And they, they push the boulder all the way up and then the boulder rolls down and they find a new mountain. But I mean, I guess, I don't know, hear me out on this one. The, the, the reason that, you know, people are often, you know, individually dissatisfied with capitalism is because it's a bunch of small mountains, right? Like it's like, go do work for this day. And you will get money. I mean, it's, you know, it, it depends on the person. Maybe some people are, you know, saving up like, you know, after, you know, the end of this month, I, I'm going to go on vacation. And then that's their mountain that they're pushing to. But the, I guess, you know, I wonder, is it because it's, you know, so many small mountains, right? Like, it's just like, get this money at the end of the week. And then, you know, that's, that's, that's your, your little mountain. I don't know. Your life. I feel like it's, it's small mountains, but it's also like a huge mountain, which you just like, there's no catharsis. Right. There's right. no massive thing that you work towards and get unless you make uh, what whatever your first million in 30 years or you know, those ridiculous uh, milestones that we've just arbitrarily set. You know, um, I mean, all this this talk about, um, you know, these large, large and small mountains within a, like you said, capitalist society. The thing is, people, it's not as if no one finds happiness within a capitalist society. Right. It's it's just that. Uh, it tends towards that people have found less happiness on in general in such a society, and you know that's part of that is because of the um, well, I guess because the there's no catharsis, right? There's no general end. It's just you keep making money um, until you have enough to support your kids and you have enough to retire. How much is that? 
it depends how much you love your kids, I guess. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean that's true. I guess yeah. There's there's no there's no big moment of of being done, right? There's no, I don't know. I, I love the marathon metaphor. There's no you know crossing the finish line of of life in in capitalism, right? There's always maybe you retire, but you know there's always work you can be doing. Or, you know there's always the chance financial hardship hardship will hit. So I don't know. I I guess you could say yeah that that that's part of the problem. Yep. Yeah. Well, hmm. in terms of, I guess, existentialism and absurdism, I don't know. Is there any question that you guys feel we haven't covered yet? I mean, I don't know. There, there's always the big existentialist. What is the meaning of life, right? I mean, I, I, I think could could try and tackle that one in the next twenty minutes. <laughs> I feel like we we've kind of. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I've I have a question for y'all. I mean, we tra- oh, yeah, let's talked about it. yeah. We talked about the the purpose of happiness, or oh, uh-oh. uh oh. We talked about the purpose of life being happiness. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about like that being the grand, the you know, the grand thing to kind of um, want. And so here's a question: Why happiness? Right? I mean, according to everything we know about neurophysiology, because we love science, um, happiness is your your little dopamine and endorphins and neurotransmitters floating around in your brain, right? And the fact that we want this to be the goal is simply because it instills in us, right? Dopamine essentially just makes us want to do things more, right? And so it's, it's a matter of reinforcing patterns of behavior. Um, and so the, the feeling of happiness that we feel is kind of an interpretation of that reinforcing patterns of behavior. It's our brain saying, you got to do this more. This is helpful for us might not be helpful for us. It might be junk food. It might be drugs. It might be uh, video games or whatever, but it, it, it fulfills like some biological urge. And because our, uh, our, well, I guess uh, meat suit chemistry or body chemistry, <laughs> but, but meat suit chemistry is stuck in uh, 200,000 BC. You know, we, we are slave to these biological urges, although our, I, you know, at the risk of sounding pretentious, right? Our minds are hopefully well ahead of that 200,000 BC um, in terms of the content that our mind is dealing with. The, our minds themselves, the biology that governs them, no, we're still stuck back there, which is exactly the problem, right? When right. I say that, hey, happiness, or when we say that, hey, happiness is the goal, happiness is just like another arbitrary set of things, right? Right. right. Does it have any intrinsic meaning? I mean, if not, I, I think it's worth saying that, hey, if it doesn't have any intrinsic meaning, then that's fine. We just need to like contend with that. We just need to contend with the fact that, hey, perhaps happiness like has no inherent meaning. I'm deciding that it has the meaning in that, you know, it has meaning enough for me to decide to commit myself to happiness, to commit myself to this goal. Because we talk about absurdity and creating your own meaning. If creating your own meaning is, is happiness, is, you know, as Aristotle puts it, eudaimonia, as um, I don't know any other, I can't think of any, any other interpretations of happiness. But regardless, not having pneumonia. What did you say? Eudaimonia. 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 Yes. That's <laughs> that was so good. Not, not pneumonia. Sorry not, about that. I'll, I'll speak a little slower. Get into that <laughs> radio show <laughs> voice. That, that podcast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, hey, not, pod- podcast. not, no, not, not podcast. No, 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 not podcast. Sorry, podcasts, a radio show. Podcasts are recorded, Carter. Oh, and this no. show is not recorded. Okay, well, the show. Uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, to go back to your initial point, I think that that's something I hear a lot of people bring up, right? You know, if, if happiness is the goal, why not just do drugs, right? Why not? Why not? Not just, my point, but also I know I, that's that's what <laughs> I heard you saying, right? Like that sometimes you know happiness can be damaging, right? You you brought up junk food as another example, right? You see, like I, I've heard people say that to me before. You know, if the goal is happiness, why not you know shortcut through all of the, you know the hard work and stuff and just take the stuff that alters brain chemistry. But I don't know. I feel like that in the end isn't, isn't, doesn't, doesn't work. Right. Like I feel like, yeah. I, I feel Why like, not? Well, because Avik, you need no, no, more I, than just happiness. Yeah. It's not about the actual thing itself. It's about the getting there. About the journey, not the destination. Right. And that's what I was saying. Like with the whole like mountain. I don't know. That's that's what my dad always says about long car rides, and I, like I don't I don't know if that's true. <laughs> the, yeah, the journey's rides, kind of journey's kind of bad a sometimes. Different story, but um, I think that you know. Yeah, I don't know. I was gonna, I was gonna say, but 
I mean, the the point about like drug use and for we don't have to talk about drugs in specific, but you know, engaging in harmful behaviors for the sake of achieving some kind of short term happiness. Yeah. Is that a lot of philosoph- philosophical thought makes this distinction between happiness and satisfaction, or pleasure and satisfaction? Oh, it's really? Two, two different things, two two different aspects of happiness, right? Or pleasure is this kind of short form biological, uh, you know, urge, while happiness, or sorry, satisfaction is this fulfillment of some need. Um, I, I don't know if either of y'all are familiar with my boy Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. Mm, uh, like mm. But he's he's yeah, not yeah, all yeah. Talk he's, talk to us who you know, who was who was Maslow and and he made a he made a, a a pyramid. He did make a pyramid, and I will actually not talk to you about who is Maslow because um, <laughs> that would require me to talk for longer than we have, and it's not relevant to what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. But the point is, he created this. He was a sociologist. That's what, that's what y'all need to know. And uh, he created this hierarchy of needs where. You need, so it's this pyramid-esque thing where each layer of the pyramid is a different need or a different type of need. Uh, And of course, the bottom layer and the bottom most layers are the base and you need the base to kind of build on top, right? So the uttermost base uh, need uh, are your physiological needs, which is your very basic like air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and means of reproduction, right? It is your ultimately biological needs as well. Um, And then... Because he's a sociologist, we do in fact graduate from that uh, that evolutionarily uh, evolutionary psychology aspect. We then go on to safety needs. We get on to like personal security. You know, in today's world, this may mean unemployment. This may mean having resources. This may mean having good health. This may mean having property. And then on top of your safety needs, then comes your love and belonging needs. They're your interpersonal needs. They're your friendships. They're your you know. Perhaps more intimate relationships to your family. It's this interpersonal sense of connection. And then on top of that love and belonging, we have esteem, which is you know self-esteem, but it's also esteem from other people. It's this respect, it's the status, it's the recognition. And at you know, it's it ultimately becomes this kind of freedom. And then once you have your physiological needs, your safety needs, your love and belonging needs, and your esteem needs all covered, then you can reach the pinnacle which is fulfilling this need of self-actualization, which is, you know, becoming the most that one can be and like achieving that, that true personal greatness and finding your purpose and that kind of thing. And so I'm going to be completely honest. Uh, I forgot why I brought this up. Carter, why did I bring this up? <laughs> mm, let's see. Uh, hierarchy of needs. Well, you see, I brought this up because we were talking about like uh, the meaning of well, you know, is what is happiness, happiness versus pleasure, that kind of deal. And so, you know, that idea of drugs and video games and whatever, everything and everything else that people are addicted to in our modern times kind of all fall under that satisfaction of physiological needs. And maybe, maybe to some degree, right, there, there are the most, you know, for example, some other addictions prey on vulnerable people who don't have the love and belonging needs either. But the point is that these all base kind of uh, these all base kind of addictions, for instance, prey on these lower level needs, but they don't prey on the self actualization. Because self actualization is a self driven task. It's this self driven um, deal to finding yourself. It's this. It has to be self motivated, right? Otherwise, it isn't self actualization. It's you know it may be esteem because it's some kind of status, um, but it isn't something that you make by yourself. And you have to make something by yourself in order to fulfill this complete hierarchy of need, right? And so it is this sense of purpose. It's this sense of wanting to, it may be for some people, the sense of wanting to understand, right? A lot of people who study religion, a lot of people who study uh, science, both have the same actual drive for understanding. It's just that they've happened to live in different cultures, for instance. A lot of astrophysicists happen to be fervent, What's uh, well, fervent believers, and so there's this the the, the concept of self actualization as this kind of pinnacle of the the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as this pinnacle of what designs to be our purpose, what we ought to move towards, and what you know existentially we ought to move towards, rather than pleasure, rather than any of any of the other physiological needs. I think that's a really important idea that there is this, uh, like. There is this uttermost need that every human has, right? And you have to, uh, well, you have to identify that. 
I mean, I think this goes back to the beginning when you talked about, you know, the difference between happiness and satisfaction. And I think the idea with satisfaction is that you have an expectation, right? I don't know. When I think of satisfaction, I think of like, I don't know, for some reason like a like a fancy restaurant, right? And the, the waiter is like, are you, are you satisfied with your meal, right? That's because you set an expectation before you ate the meal as to how it was going to be. And then, you know, the waiter is checking in to see you know, how your expectations were met. I think I think it goes back to you know Charlie was saying you know if you're if you're raised in a, a culture where this is you know you expect to have I don't know things like blankets and you know pillows comfortable beds you know modern technology in general then whenever you don't have it right you're you're not satisfied you're you're dissatisfied you're underwhelmed because you don't have the stuff that you know you were brought up with the, the stuff that you had you know, you know the, the normal context you have, you 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 don't have any of that. You're you're put at a base level, whereas you know someone who is born you know at, at a different level of happiness, right, and then has their happiness raised, they'd say they're they're satisfied, they're they're overwhelmed. Carter, would you say that satisfaction is the first derivative of happiness? Mm, yes, yes, that's a it's a it's a nice way to use calculus. Indeed. So, it. it's, uh, it's can it. you explain it for the layman? Of course, uh, Carter, go ahead. I don't understand that much calculus. You but, do understand that much calculus. So, I, <laughs> no, you, you, you had the, you had the metaphor. You go for it. Okay. I want I, I want you to fully flesh it out. Of course. Okay. Well, um, the idea of derivatives and calculus is if you think of some kind of curve in in space, right? Um, and you think of kind of the 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 slope of that curve, like how flat the curve is, how steep the curve is, um, right? It just measures how much that thing is changed as you move from left to right right? Uh, a point goes like up and down and up and down and whatever on the curve. Um, but the, you know, how much does a point move up and how much does a point move down every time you're moving from left to right? And the point is that if it's a, if it's a shallower slope, at, you know, at a particular point, like so, let's say it's a hump uh, that you're thinking of. So if it's a shallower point, then you'll have a low amount of, and in this case, if your happiness is a hump, like it goes up and then it goes down, right? Then at the very pinnacle, your happiness is, you know, your your satisfaction was climbing up and now your satisfaction is going back down. So, you know, are you really satisfied when your happiness is not changing? And then... It's a great way to put it, actually. Yeah. Uh, and the extension of this is that, you know, is your ha- as your happiness increases, your satisfaction is positive because your ha- your happiness, and as we're defining happiness, right, this kind of um, current, current uh, ide- idealization of your of your uh, existence, I guess, of your situation, of your condition, right? Um, the the current measure of your condition is as that improves, you feel satisfied, but as that declines, you feel dissatisfied. And it doesn't matter. Well, the assumption is uh, when I'm bringing this up is that it doesn't matter. You know, if you're going from a terrible situation to a slightly less terrible situation, or a great situation to a slightly greater situation, right? The point is that that change in happiness is still the same. And so you will always kind of um, revert to, you will always kind of revert uh, to, or well, not rather revert, but tend to that slope of happiness, how much you get happier. And that, that is a, the idea is that that is a matter, measure of satisfaction. Right. Yeah. So all to say, you know, happiness and satisfaction are very closely related, right? Not not identical things, but, you know, often when your happiness increases, your satisfaction increases, especially, you know, you had an expectation, you know, of happiness, I'm going to be X happiness, and then you end up being X plus one happiness. And, you know, that's, that's great. That's some, that's some nice satisfaction. You know, if you're X minus one satisfi- you know, happiness, then you become you know, unsatisfied, right? I think, you know, that's, that's the idea that they're, they're tied together. They're not the same thing, but I think, you know, happiness is almost like the, the raw value and then satisfaction is happiness contextualized. There's actually a Buddhist quality to this, uh, this idea of, you know, happiness and satisfaction being inherently tied to your expectations in that Buddhists say that one, life is suffering uh, but more, more precisely, desire is suffering. A desire leads to suffering because the very act of desiring something, right, uh, will ultimately lead to s- dissatisfaction because everything is impermanent. Everything changes. And so although you may wish for one particular thing and you may get that thing in, in due time, that thing will eventually fade. That thing will eventually disappear. And maybe that thing is a long life. Eventually, you're going to die. Maybe that thing is 
um, happiness, you're going to be happy and happy for the rest of your life, perhaps. And then you're going to die. Um, yeah. And so maybe that thing is a job. At some point, you are you might get fired from that job. You'll have to retire and you won't have that job. And perhaps your um, things will have changed by then. But the point is that life inherently becomes suffering just because of the expectations that we set for ourselves. And so the idea within, in particular Zen Buddhism is that if you let go of these desires, then you let go of suffering. If you, which is pretty much if saying... You realize, like, if you realize that they're empty... Mm. Is the idea in, in, Buddha, in Zen Buddhism specifically? I mean, yeah. If you let go of these things that are arbitrary, it's like completely like Charlie said. Um, and so that's the idea behind some of our, I guess, less Western um, compatriots. And we were going to do a an episode on Buddhism, but unfortunately, uh, we could not have our guest on the air. Um, but regardless, we will keep our fingers crossed. For next year. Well, to be more specific, next fall. Next fall. Next And I will uh, not be here, calendar. unfortunately. I will be in the oh, land yeah? of the rising sun. Oh, really? I will be. Yeah, all f- fall term, right? Fall or, term. Yep. All of fall term. Wow. I'll be in Nippon. Wow. Very scary. All right. Well scary. Why is it scary? Man? <laughs> terrifying. We'll have to we'll have to do this. We'll have to do this without you, without your guidance okay. and your expertise. <laughs> So, regardless, um, this has been Exeter Jazz Lounge. No, it hasn't. <laughs> oh my gosh. Are you really um, trying to keep us on our toes like that? Or, I am. Or... And we're back. This is... What is this? This is School of Athens? It's this not Exeter Jazz Lounge. It is not Exeter Jazz Lounge. This is School of Believe Athens. Believe it or not. This is, uh, more specifically, this is WPEA 90.5 FM Exeter, Big Red Radio. You're currently listening to School of Athens. I'm your co-host, Avi Guadifkar. I'm Charlie Scales. And I'm Carter Otis. And so we've just finished up our final discussion of the year, a little bit of existentialism, a little bit about meaning. I'm thinking we do a whole summary of what we've gone over this year. Man, uh, really well, hard. we started a while ago with uh, with the trolley problem, right? And, you know, we talked about, you know, that, that's the idea that you've got a trolley on, on one track headed towards five people. You can switch it to hit one person. And we talked about, you know, the value of life. Does, can, can a life have a a value and, and a quantity to it. Um, I don't know. Uh, Avik, where, where do we, where do we go from there after we talked about the trolley problem? Well, I believe we had quite a few discussions and um, perhaps this wasn't this term necessarily, but quite a few discussions on uh, Greek philosophers, which mm. were kind of heralded by Charlie. I don't know, Charlie, you remember anything about those? No, I don't at all. Um, I remember uh, the first one was, uh, what was, what was his name? Socrates? No, that is not the, <laughs> that's the whole point that it wasn't Socrates, pre Socratics. Um, it was, hold up, Hippoc- Hipp- No, it wasn't Hippocrates. Ah, I'm going to look it up. Uh, but regardless, we, we <laughs> talked about pre Socratics and we also talked about Socrates, the man himself, with a special guest. Thales, Thales of Miletus. Mm. Thales of Miletus, you heard it here. Yes, we talked about pre Socratics. We talked about. Uh, Socratics being yeah. being Socrates yes. himself. Yeah, we had a, a special guest on that one. Oh yes, yeah. We talked about we talked about justice for a little bit. We we talked about consciousness. You remember those ones? That was oh. a good one. Actually. Yeah. Is there anything more to us than our mind or our body? Talked a little about free will as well oh, and the yes. lack thereof. Oh, yes, fun. possibly? Question mark. We'll see. Um, but <laughs> regardless, see. we've done we've done stuff like that. We've done existentialism now as mm-hmm. we come to the the modern point. And that's that's pretty much what we've gone over. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, for all of our listeners, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to reach out to us at uh, plus one three six one two five four four two seven nine, or just send a message to uh, WPEA or Exeter, just telling them what a good job we've been doing mm, and how much you enjoy our show and how much we and actually we should be getting paid for. We show. should be. We should be. <laughs> Um, but uh, regardless, this has been an episode, our last show uh, of the year. The year. Uh, Charlie, will this be your last show? No, period? I want to come back. <laughs> yeah, be back, yeah. be back yeah. in the winter. I hope so. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, well this will be uh, Carter and I will say goodbye for a few months. Charlie saying goodbye for six months. That's me. Signing off. This is Avik